those auto insurance, fire insurance, things like that. Those are all insurances we hope we never have to use, right? But life insurance, you're definitely going to use. Why not help not only ourselves while we're living, but our next generation? Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast. My name is Derek Felch. I am one of six hosts who bring you conversations three times every week on a variety of topics that often center around real estate, business, and personal motivation. Our goal with this podcast is simply to help you succeed in whatever target you're aiming at. We are all committed to finding the best and the brightest people to interview who aren't just talking about doing big things, but are actually taking steps to achieve their dreams and also want to help others along the way. Today, I am joined by Mr. Brent Kessler. Brent is an author and a speaker who has spent the last 10 years talking to thousands of people around the country about his method to build financial wealth that he calls the money multiplier. It's a method based on concepts often referred to by some as infinite banking. Some say it's a secret tool of the wealthy, and others say it's a way to sell high commission items to more people. And if you've heard of it, I'm fairly certain you fall into one side of the camp or the other. But before you skip over this to listen to one of our other hosts and our other great podcasts, can I first say this? I'm a complete and total skeptic of this system. I told Brent that from the at the beginning, and I told him I wanted to be able to ask him anything, and he was completely open to that. And I think our conversation could have and probably should have gone on longer, and hopefully we can bring him back again to answer some more questions. And I do think he was gracious, and he answered some of my questions and objections and did share how he feels his methods could benefit people in some situations. Now, I'm not ready to go out and jump into it and buy policies yet, but I appreciate his willingness to come on and chat with us. And I hope, again, that you will take a moment to listen to it and then, you know, hear someone's uh, opinions and then and then make a judgment for yourself. Uh, I do hope you find it, value in it. And uh, if you do, I hope you remember to hit that subscribe button because 98% of you are going to completely ignore that sentence. But with that, let's talk to Brent. All right. Well, welcome, Brent. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on here. I, I'm uh, excited to learn more about you, excited to hear uh, your thoughts on on some of your financial strategies and to ask you some questions. But but first off, what, what do you want people to know about you? Brent Kessler here. The name of our company is called The Money Multiplier. So if you go to our website, themoneymultiplier.com. So that's us. Um, and just to give you a quick backstory, you know, um, actually, I'm a chiropractor. I no longer practice chiropractic anymore. Um, I own a total of five clinics in the Kansas City area. And I know, Derek, that's where you're uh, close to. You're based out of close to Kansas City in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and so like, I have not practiced chiropractic since about 2008. Um, I had associate docs in my clinic. Um, I actually sold my last clinic in 2017. My wife and I became empty nesters and I moved back to Florida, um, which is where I basically was raised in Florida. And I, um, right. So after the kids got out of high school and stuff, we moved back to Florida and, but now I come to you today, I'm at my house in Island Park, Idaho, which is on the Montana, Idaho, Wyoming border. And I spend a couple of months or a month and a half in the summer here. And then I'll be off here on the 12th of August to the Lake of the Ozarks, which is between St. Louis and Kansas City. And I spend some time there um, as well. Um, but anyway, Derek, this concept I'm going to share, the banking concept that we're going to talk about a little bit, I first heard about it in 2006. It's called the Infinite Banking Concept. Um, and I thought it was too good to be true. I was actually in a chiropractic conference and I heard somebody talking about this concept. Um, and I thought it looked good, but it just seems too good to be true. Right. I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like that. Well, that was me. And I did nothing with the information that I heard. 
I went home. I went back to my uh, chiropractic clinics. I was in, again, I, I said Kansas City. I was in Olathe, Overland Park, Ottawa, and Tonganoxie. That's where I had clinics at. Um, and I went back and I did nothing. And then I go back to another chiropractic conference almost two years ago, about two years later, and about 10 or 12 of my chiropractic colleagues that were at that previous conference with me are now at this conference again. Now, Derek, the only difference between them and me is they heard this information on the banking concept and they acted up on it. They implemented it. They were doing it in their life. And they were coming up to me and basically throwing up all over me saying, Brent, isn't this banking concept the most powerful thing to build, keep and create wealth in your family? All without working any harder, all without changing your cash flow, all without taking any additional risk or losing control of your money. And they were going on and on and on about this. And I thought to myself, there had to be something to this, right? Because there's no way that 10 or 12 of my colleagues are lying, maybe one or two, but not 10 or 12. So I went home and I told my wife, and it was in February of 2008. And at that time, I was $984,711 in debt. That's what I owed to the third-party creditors, almost a million dollars in debt. Now, you're probably thinking, how does a guy from Kansas get to be about a million dollars in debt? I know if you live in California, that buys you a very small house, right? But in Kansas, it buys you a lot. Well, I had the house that I lived in. I had my student loans from chiropractic college. I had my chiropractic clinic. I'm also an airplane pilot. So as an airplane pilot, um, I had to have my own airplane. And I also had a house on the Lake of the Ozarks between St. Louis and Kansas City. And if you have a house on the lake, guess what you have to have? A boat and a wave runner, right? You can't have a house on a lake without a boat and a wave runner. So it didn't take me a lot to become almost a million dollars in debt. I was able to put this concept into place and I was able to pay that debt off in 39 months. And all I did was added this one step to my financial life. I became really passionate about it. And then, so one day I went to Lawrence, Kansas, and the guy that I started my first policy with, his name was Ray. He walked downstairs of his office, and I know you're from, from Lawrence, and it was on Mesa Avenue. That's where his office was. I walked downstairs, or, or again, so, okay, so he walked downstairs, and again, I was just at his office to ask him some questions about my policies. And he says, Brent, he says, you have referred me a total of 41 new customers. And I kind of laughed and I said, Ray, you've never paid me a dime for any of those, right? And he said, no, no, no. He says, in all seriousness, he says, you understand this concept. You do it very well. You're telling other people about it. So maybe you should consider doing this. I was like, what? I can do this. He said, yeah. I said, what do I do? He says, go get licensed and you can come aboard in our agency and I'll help you. And that's what I did. I did that in March of 2012. And I stayed there in that agency as a life insurance producer, right? I got my life insurance license and I'm licensed in every state of the country. And I stayed, okay, I stayed in his office working until about mid-2017. And then I went out and started my own agency. So it's been a little over six years now. And now I have over 7,000 clients in every state of the country. And I would, I would almost tell you, I don't, I don't know this 100% fact, but I'm pretty sure that we are the number one producers of infinite banking business on this planet. I don't think any agency in this country does what we do. And the reason I can say that is because on these insurance companies that we write business with, they give us every month what they call a performance stat and they show us like the leaders in the industry. And when I add up all the dollars or all of the premium and all of the cases that all the other people that are in this industry have, 
they don't equal to what we're doing in our agency. So I can't promise you we're the number one in the country, but we're right up there if we're not. And this is all we do. We eat, live, and breathe this. I do it in my own life, Derek. I have 26 of my own policies. I design the client's policy the same way I design mine. There's no secret sauce that I put on mine that I don't put on yours. So infinite banking, as I understand it, and, and I'm definitely uh, not, not an expert in it, uh, but uh, infinite banking is the idea of using cash, cash value life insurance policies, overfunding them, borrowing against them, paying yourself back that interest. Um, right. Is that, a, is, that a, is that a really simplistic view of what it is? Yeah, that is a simplistic view. And so let me even make it more simple. All we're doing is we're adding one step into your financial life. Because see, here's what people do. Every time they get money in, it can be active income, passive income, investment income. It could be a check in the mail from grandma for your birthday. The thing that we do is we take that money and we put it into the conventional bank, the Bank of Lawrence, Kansas, the Bank of Daytona Beach, Florida, the Bank of Island Park, Idaho. The thing we do is we put that money into a conventional bank and then we write checks out against it to pay other people. Well, all we want to do, Derek, is add one step. We want that money to go into our own banking system first. And then from our own banking system, so essentially what we're doing is we're going to pay ourselves first. And then from there, we're going to send that money out to all the people that we owe, our debts, expenses, our products, our services, our investments, whatever we're buying, right? So now when you do that, all that money stays in your family. There's no money being leaked out. So anytime you're using the insurance company's money in the form of a policy loan, you're not using your money that you have in your policy. No, no, no. So all of your money is still in the policy growing and compounding, uninterrupted compound interest. So you're keeping that money in the family. Now, before we get too off into the weeds, Derek, I want to give credit where credit is due. This book completely changed my life. I did not invent this concept that I teach people. I did not invent the infinite banking concept. There's a guy named R. Nelson Nash. R. Nelson Nash wrote this book the, uh, okay, called Becoming Your Own Banker. R. Nelson Nash passed away in March of 2019, so a little over four years ago at age 87. This man completely changed my financial life. This is a book that you want to add to your wealth building library because if it wasn't for his teachings, I would not be doing it. Um, so the other gentlemen, there's two gentlemen that both you and I talked about earlier, they wouldn't be doing it. And not only did Nelson write that book, he wrote a book called Case for IBC. He wrote a book called Building Your Warehouse of Wealth. So I wanna give credit of everything I've learned is based on Nelson Nash's teaching. So those are books you want to add into your wealth building library. Now, I'm, I'm going to say one other thing, Derek. I wrote a book called Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery with a colleague of mine called Chris Noggle about three or four years ago. And any of your listeners that want that ebook version for free, all they have to do is email me, brent at themoneymultiplier.com. I'm happy to send it to them. If you really want the hard copy of the book, I'll send it to you. I think it's five or six bucks for postage, whatever it is. I'm not looking to make money off of the book. That's not what I want to do. I want to give it to you for free, but I want you to have the information that's out there. Okay, so let me let me ask you a couple of questions. And I'm going to kind of run with the assumption that people have have heard you or heard other people talk about infinite banking so because i have some questions that i'd love answers for and uh so uh, similar to you I, I found myself in debt not not close to a million dollars but my wife and i found ourselves in debt about 22 years ago we found a book called financial peace by dave ramsey and we followed everything it said for like we just decided 30 days we're gonna do whatever it says i mean if it had said burn leaves in your front yard we would have been doing that and that really helped us form a budget, form some basic financial principles, and uh, and move forward. However, as you know, uh, and Dave is, you know, I've I've had to part ways a little bit because now we have real estate debt and stuff. But uh, and Dave is definitely a one size fits all answer for everything. 
but clearly is not a huge fan of the infinite banking concept. And I listened to a video uh, yesterday because I was trying to do a little more research and it was him responding to his thoughts. And then, then I watched a second video of someone else responding to his response and both had some generalities and skipped over a few things. But some people really like this concept and some people really feel like it's just kind of, you know, it it's not as great as, as you make it sound. So um, I guess my question is help. I mean, you know, you know the common objections, but how did that system help you pay off the three years in three years the debt? Like, is there a little more detail to that? Yeah. Um, it, yep, there is. Um, actually, on my presentation, like if you go to my website, www.themoneymultiplier.com, and if you click under presentation and watch Brent now, I have a full hour and a half plus presentation, and I go over it in great detail. And there's and and anyway, there's this thing on there called the money multiplier map, where I actually show you how a real life client paid off almost $470,000 of debt. He owed 12 third party creditors and he paid off and it was just a little under $470,000 and he paid it off in a total of 61 months and he was putting in $25,000 a year into his policy. So if you fast forward all the way to the end, he injected $160,000 of outside money into his policy. He kept his cash flow the same. In other words, he was paying the minimum monthly payments on those 12 third-party debts. He injected $160,000 of outside money, $160,000 of outside money, and paid off that debt in 61 months, which was going to take him 18 years to do. So it's kind of hard to explain it, just both you and I on the call, but that's why I give specific examples on that. I, I show you how that's mapped out, okay? Now, even if you don't have any debt, even if you just want to use the policy to buy your cars that you buy for you and your family or to buy your real estate that you invest in or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You can use this concept for anything and everything that you want. And so let me just comment on the Dave Ramsey thing. I get Dave Ramsey. I get Susie Orman. Before I, before I ever, ever started doing this, I would record um, every Saturday night when I was gone, I would record Susie Orman. I have every book and tape and cassette tape and CD that Dave Ramsey ever put out. I believe Dave Ramsey does a good thing, okay? What Dave Ramsey does is he helps you to get back to zero, he helps you to get out of the debt that you're in and climb out of the hole. But then when you get out of debt, then what? Dave Ramsey wants you to live below your means while you're doing this. Now, have you ever Googled Dave Ramsey's house? And, and, and if you haven't, you should. And all your listeners should Google Dave Ramsey's house. And here's the guy telling you to live below your means. And he's probably living below his means in that house. I get it. But Dave Ramsey is an entertainer. Dave Ramsey is talking to the masses of people. Dave Ramsey will never come and sit down with you at your kitchen table, Derek, or anybody on this podcast and talk to you about your own financial situation and coach you through it. He's an entertainer. Now, myself, others, we have tried to have a debate, not really a debate, a discussion with Dave Ramsey about the concept. He doesn't want anything to do with that. A lot of my colleagues in this industry, as a matter of fact, if you go out and you and and just like all you got to do is go Google my name or YouTube my name and Chris Noggle, the guy that wrote the book with me, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, Google his name. Both both Chris and I, we created a video. I think it's about an hour and a half long where both of us are there and Dave Ramsey is going on and on and on about the infinite banking concept. And Chris and I are going back and forth and having the discussion about everything Dave Ramsey is saying. He's simply not telling you the truth. He's just not, I mean, again, I'm okay if he tells you the truth, but there's so many points in there that we point out that he doesn't tell you, that he's not telling you the truth. 
So here's what Dave Ramsey tells you. He tells you to buy term and invest the rest. Buy term and invest the rest. Well, okay, that's a great idea, but how many people do you know are actually going out there and investing the rest? Not many. And as you know, term insurance. Yeah, term insurance is okay to protect you if something happens with you. But did you know, Derek, that less than 2% of all term policies actually ever pay out? Because if the insurance company thought you were going to die during that term, they would never sell you the policy. So the only way that you win in a term insurance policy is if you die during that term. Now, it is a way to beat the insurance company. It's not a very exciting way to do it. It's kind of like going to Vegas and thinking you're going to win. It's probably just not going to happen. So why not instead, why not get a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that has guaranteed cash value growth, it's been paying, all these insurance companies I work with have been paying policy dividends for over 123 consecutive years without fail, right? But even if they don't pay a dividend, you still have a guaranteed growth inside of the policy. And now what you're going to do is use that money while you're living. And then at the time, it's not an if you die, pass, or graduate, whatever word you like to use. It's a when. It's a when, it's not an if. Now at that time, the thing you're doing is you're passing on tons of money to the next generation. And all during that time, what you've been able to do is use the cash value in your policy. Because remember, in this type of policy, Derek, you can start using that cash value immediately. So when you put money into that policy, you can use it immediately. And my definition of immediately is within the first 30 days. So why not do that where you have guarantees? It's guaranteed to grow in a tax-free environment and the government is out of your hair and you're going to leave your children, your grandchildren and future generations to come a lot of money. I like that answer. But let me ask you just so a couple of things and, and then I, I'd like you to help me clarify a few of his objections. So I, I have heard often the the term policy not paying out, but in reality, I mean, and I'm, I, and you know, I, I appreciate you being willing to come on and let me ask these questions. Like that's, I mean, I've paid tens of thousands of dollars for auto insurance and homeowners and renters and landlord and, and none of it's ever paid out on me. So, <laughs> I mean, that, that, but so his two big objections or one of them was t that I didn't understand. And, and uh, it's interesting, as I was saying before, and, and I think it's important because I, I really look at our society and we all have very strong opinions about lots of things. But when we step back and say, why do I think that? It's probably based on, well, someone else told me that's the way it is. So uh, I, I really do want to seek to understand things. But one of the things he mentioned in his video was uh, the overfunding, that you don't get the over, when you overfund your, your cash value life insurance, when you die, it's only going to pay out the value of the policies. Can you help unpack that and your your counterpoint or... Uh, how, what, what did he mean by that? And is that true, false? Well, so, so like, I'm like, I'm not exactly sure hundred percent as far as what Dave meant about it, but let me talk about overfunding the policy and what that really means. Um, and just before I go there, like, okay, so just the thing that you mentioned, Derek, was auto insurance, fire insurance, things like that. Those are all insurances we hope we never have to use, right? We don't want to ever get in an auto accident. We don't ever want our house to catch on fire. And those things may never happen, and you may pay those premiums forever and never, ever use them. But life insurance, you're definitely going to use because you're guaranteed to die, pass, or graduate. There's no question about it. It's going to happen. The only because all of us have an expiration date, we just don't know when that is. So it is going to happen. So if we know that's going to happen, why not have it to where we're able to help not only ourselves while we're living, but our next generations, our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, and future generations to come and leave that legacy because we know it's going to happen. So, okay. 
So overfunding the policy. So let me explain it this way. And if I don't answer your question, Derek, please ask me again. Because before we went live, I wanted you. I asked you. I said, Derek, ask me any question you want. There's no secrets. Be hard on me. Hard, hard, hard. Ask me anything you want. So in a policy, in a whole life policy, in a mutual company that pays dividends, that is designed for the infinite banking concept, the way we structure that policy is it has two parts to it. It has a base premium and what we call a paid up additions rider premium. Now the paid up additions rider premium is optional. Okay. A person does not have to put money into that, but that would be the part that we're overfunding. So like when a client comes to us and so they want to do this, we never tell you how much premium to put in the policy. You tell us, I don't care if you want to put in a hundred dollars a month or if you want to put, I think our largest client that we have puts in $540,000 a month. So pick a number in between there. Okay. And the way you pay your premium, you can pay it monthly, quarterly, twice a year, annually. You can also always lower your premium at any time you want by at least 60% or even greater. So when the policy is designed, let's just say that you come to me, Derek, and you say, Brent, I want to do one of these policies. And I'll say, Derek, how much money do you want to put into it? And you say, I want to put in 10000 a year into my policy. Okay. So probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to design it something like this. It's not all cookie cutter, but probably based on you, your health, your age, all of that, I'm going to take that $10,000 and we're going to put $4,000 into the base premium and we're going to put $6,000 into the paid up additions rider. Now, I could just make those ratios a little bit different, but but the most important thing is is I want to make sure when I design that policy and put that premium in, I want to make sure the policy never becomes what we call a MEC. MEC, it stands for Modified Endowment Contract. Now, our good old government came up with the MEC back in June of 1988 because all these people were just stuffing money in their policies. And the government says, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. We got to design something, you know to prevent all of this. So they came up with this MEC guideline. So what we do, and also in this book, Becoming Your Own Banker, Nelson Nash talks about the MEC on page number 38 in great detail. He goes in great detail about it. So when we design your policy, we snuggle it right up to the MEC line without going over it. Because if your policy becomes a MEC, it's no longer treated as an insurance contract. It's treated as an investment and it's subject to taxation. So we never ever want that. So we avoid mecking out that policy. And this is also, Derek, why people can't continue to come back and stuff a whole bunch of more money into that same policy because it'll throw it into MEC status. So what they have to do is go out and start additional policies. So of that premium that I just told you about, the $4,000 in base premium, the $6,000 in PUA. So basically it's a 40-60 split. Well, in the beginning stages when that policy starts, the base premium has no cash value in the first year. And it doesn't have very much or very little in the second year. The paid up additions rider, in this case, the 6,000 or the 60% is what's driving your cash value in the policy. So when you pay money into the policy and when you take out a loan, you're putting the policy up for collateral and you're able to borrow. That's why you're able to borrow roughly about 60% because of the way the policy was designed. If I designed it 20% base and 80% PUA, that's okay too. Then you could borrow a little bit more. But the only problem with that is you have to throw a term rider onto the policy to prevent the MEC status. So there's pros and cons to doing it both ways, okay? Now, of that 60%, that is your cash value that you're able to use immediately. Now, the next year, what happens is your cash value increases because the policy is one more year efficient. The third year, it's basically dollar for dollar. So every dollar you put into that policy in the third year, you're getting 
almost dollar for dollar back out that you can use. And every year after that, you take more money out than you're putting it in. So this is why in our teachings, we always say you want as much money getting into that policy in the third year and beyond as possible. So Derek, I have over 7,000 clients in every state of the country. Nobody, nobody, not one client that's been with me for three years or longer has ever quit paying premium into that policy because of the cash value growth. The only time that you're going to quit is in the first two years if you have a severe financial catastrophe or disaster and it happens in the first two years where you're going to quit. Now, so the overfunding is this paid up additions rider. So here's what happens. Every year, the insurance company declares a dividend. That is the profit in the insurance company. They declare the dividend. Now, the dividends aren't guaranteed, but every company I've worked with has been paying dividends for over 123 consecutive years. Now, let's think about 123 years. That was a year 1900. So that means through all of the downturns in the economy, through all of the recessions, through the Great Depression of the 1920s and 1930s, insurance companies were still profitable and they paid dividends. So is there a pretty good chance they're going to still continue to pay a dividend for another 120 plus years? And the answer is yes. But even if they don't, there's a guaranteed growth in the policy. So anytime that dividend now gets distributed to the policy owner, the policy owner could elect to take that as a distribution. Our clients in the infinite banking concept do not take that as a distribution. What they do is, th is that just on those dollars, so like the dividend, it goes back into the policy to buy additional paid up additions insurance. So additional overfunding, if you will, or paid up additions rider. And when that happens, Derek, your cash value increases, your loan availability increases, and your death benefit increases, okay? So anytime that you have a windfall of money, let's say you get a windfall. Well, the thing that I tell you to do is say, look, you have this windfall of money. Are you wanting to put that money into a new policy do you want to maybe go in and put it into your existing policy to see how much it'll hold? I mean, it may not hold all of it. Chances are it's not. But now what you can do is add that money in as additional paid up additions insurance, and that'll increase the death benefit, the cash value, and the loan availability. Now, eventually, we usually get to a point, Derek, and it's usually between five and 10 years. It's not an exact science. It can be earlier if you want, or maybe it can stay on later as long as it doesn't throw the policy into the mech status. What we're going to do is we're going to drop off that paid up additions rider because now here what, okay, so now here's what's happening. And, and so what I will show you that this is in my hour and a half plus video when you watch my presentation on the mapping example, how I pay premium of $25,000 for the first five years. And then, and at the end of the fifth year, beginning of the sixth year, I drop off that paid up additions rider. So it goes down from 25 to 10. Because remember, 10,000 is going to be 40% of 25,000. So I dropped off that 60% because now the paid up additions rider, Derek, is not as efficient as it as 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 the base premium. Now the base premium is driving the cash value. So here's the way I want you and your listeners to think of the paid up additions rider or the overfunding of the policy. Have you ever seen the space shuttle take off into space? Well, here's what you have. You have a shuttle and two booster rockets. When that shuttle gets way up in the air, the booster rockets fall off. Why do they fall off? Because they're no longer needed. I'm an airplane pilot. I burn most of my fuel when I take off climbing to altitude. That's when I burn most of the fuel. When I get up to altitude, the air is thinner. I lean back the mixture, and I'm in straight and level cruise flight, and I'm burning less fuel, and it's more efficient. The same thing happens with your policy. So you're not always, I guess, using that word overfunding it. You're just 
if you have more money to put in, you're buying more policy. Is that is that correct? Well, yeah. And 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 like just to go back on that example, like if you tell me, Derek, you say, hey, I want to put in ten thousand dollars into premium. I could take your ten thousand dollars and put it all into base premium. But you're not going to have any cash value. And this is what most agents and what most insurance companies do. Because, see, even other agents and even some insurance companies, they don't want you to practice the infinite banking concept. Why? Because they don't want you to borrow out any of the premium dollars that you put in there. They want to be in control of that money. And and the reason agents don't tell you about this, even if you find an agent that understands the banking concept, which there's not a lot out there. Here's the thing I would do. Let's just say that you, Derek, go to the agent down the street. and You're like, hey, um, John, I've been working with you forever. Um, I'd like to do one of these policies and I'd like to do the infinite banking concept. And I'm going to do it with this guy, Brent, because he taught me all about it. And and John, the agent, says, no, 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 Derek, do it with me. I, I know how to do that. I can show you about it. I can tell you all about it. Well, the first question I would ask him is, well, if you know how to do it, why haven't you told me already? You know, why am I coming to you? And then if you really want to find out if that agent knows, here's what you do. Ask him these three questions. Have them show you how you can borrow at a higher rate than what you're earning and make money all day long. I show you that in my 90-minute presentation on the financial calculators. Number two, have them show you how you can buy a car and get all the money back. That's right. You get the car and you recycle and recapture and get all of the money back. So not only do you have the car, but you get the money back too. And if you can do that with a car, Derek, guess what else you can do it for? Anything in life that you buy, a house, a boat, a bicycle, your taxes, your charitable giving, your vacation, your student loans, your kid's wedding, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. You recycle and recapture that money. They're not going to understand how to do that. Number three, have them create you the money multiplier map. We create those for every one of our clients. You don't ever pay us a dime. As a matter of fact, you... You as a client, Derek, are never going to pay me a dime. How do I get paid? I get paid the same way your car insurance guy or gal gets paid. If you go to John Smith, the Allstate man, to buy car insurance, the check that you write is not to John Smith. You write it to Allstate, and Allstate pays John Smith a commission. There's no hidden cost, extra charges. The thing that makes us different from any other agency out there in the country on this planet is our policy servicing and the tools that we provide for you. That's what makes us different. Now, let's say you had your agent and he could tell you all of that stuff that I just told you. They are going to be very hesitant and skeptical to design your policy this way. Do you know why, Derek, they don't want to design your policy this way? Because in order to design it this way, they have to take a 60 Six zero to a ninety nine zero, a sixty to ninety percent cut in their commission, and they're not willing to do it. They are not willing to take that hit in their commission to design this policy. Now, I think I answered your question, but I want to just say one other thing. Look, this concept, the infinite banking concept. Yeah, I talk to skeptics all the time. Remember me? I heard about it in 2006. I didn't do it for two years because I thought it was too good to be true. But this concept is not new. It's not on trial. It's not being tested. It has been around for over 200 years. I want you and all the listeners to go out and do some homework. And here's the homework. I want you to research the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays. I want you to see how they built, kept, and created wealth in their family. Go out and, and I want you to research how Walt Disney built Disneyland. I want you to go look how Ray Kroc started McDonald's. I want you to go look and see how Pampered Chef got started before Warren Buffett purchased Pampered Chef. There's two other books. There's a guy named Robert Kiyosaki. So you guys in the real estate world know who Robert Kiyosaki is. He wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's what he's famous for. But he also wrote another book called Second Chance. In that book, Second Chance, this is exactly the concept Robert Kiyosaki talks about. The problem is you guys read that book 
and you didn't understand what in the hell that they meant because they make it too difficult to understand. How about a guy named Tony Robbins? You've heard of Tony Robbins? Tony Robbins wrote a book called Money Master the Game. In chapter 5.4, 5.4 of that Tony Robbins book, this concept that I teach every day is right there in that book. But guess what? When you read it, you didn't understand what in the heck it meant, and you just read right through it, and you never understood because they make it too difficult and too complicated to understand. So my point with that, Derek, is I just wanted to make is the concept is not new. It's not on trial. It's not being tested. We are using the same tools that the wealthy have been using for over 200 years. And all we're doing is building, keeping, and creating wealth the same way that we're, the same way they're doing it. Um, all I'm doing is I'm going to mimic and imitate what the wealthy do. And guess what? It was a quote by Warren Buffett. Guess what Warren Buffett said? I don't know when he said it, but I heard it in October of 2008. And I think about this quote every day of my life because I don't like complicated stuff. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm not the brightest candle in the cake. And some people tell me I'm a couple donuts short of a dozen. So I like simplicity. I like total stuff that's simple. And here's what Warren Buffett said. And I think about this every day of my life. Warren Buffett said, if poor people would just start doing what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. How much sense does that make? This is good. This is a lot to think about. So, it, so, so that I understand, if I, if I'm over, if I'm the money, the additional money I'm paying in that is not in my premiums that I owe for the cost of the policy. If something happens to me, does that money go away, or is that still passed on to my family? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. So in the policy, and it doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter how you pay your premium. It doesn't matter if X goes to the base premium, X goes to the paid up additions. Um, it, it doesn't matter if there's a term rider on the policy. So in your policy illustration, before you ever accept it, sign for it or pay for it, you want to look at those numbers. There's two columns. There's a guaranteed column and a non-guaranteed column. The only difference between the two columns is the non-guaranteed column is showing you what the insurance company is projecting the future dividend to be each and every year. Remember, dividends aren't guaranteed, but they've been paying them for 120 plus consecutive years. The guaranteed column in that policy, Derek, can never be lower than those numbers. And that grows also each and every year, okay? So, the way to really tell how your policy is performing compared to the non-guaranteed numbers is every year on your policy anniversary date, what we're going to do is we're going to order what we call an in-force illustration, I-N-F-O-R-C-E, and we're going to take a look at that policy that's now a year old. And we're going to compare it to the value of what the insurance company said it was going to be. Now, we know it's at least going to be the guaranteed side, but it's really going to be higher than that because the policy, because the insurance company paid a dividend. Now, it could be higher than the projection. It could be lower than the projection. But in all the years I've been doing this, it's pretty much right on course. Sometimes it's lower. Sometimes it's higher. But when you throw it all in the wash, they do a pretty good job. These actuaries do a pretty good job of what's going to happen and what that dividend is going to be based on their projections. Okay? So now the thing that you have in your policy is you have a column on there that says cash value, or sometimes it says surrender value, right? But that is the cash that you are able to use in that policy right now, today, immediately. I say, I always say immediately is within 30 days. Because I always say if you're going to get a loan on the policy, give the insurance company 30 days to process it. Now, I've never waited more than 12 business days ever to get a policy loan. And with technology, 
Now it normally goes in your bank account in two to three days with the auto deposit. But if they have to mail you a check, I've never waited more than 12 business days, but I tell you it takes 30 because if it doesn't show up in 12, I don't want you to be mad at me. Everything I present to you, all of my information that you'll find out there, which you can spend weeks looking through the data that I have out there online, my numbers in real life are actually better than what I show you because I'm a big believer of under-promising and over-delivering. I want you to get more than what I'm telling you is going to get. So in that column, it says cash value available. Let's just hypothetically say that number said $400,000, okay? And let's say your death benefit at that particular time says $1 million. Now, remember, the cash value and the death benefit continuously rise in your policy. As time goes on, the cash value rises quicker than your death benefit. And eventually, eventually, your cash value and your death benefit will equal. And when is that? That's normally at age 121. So Derek, when you get to be about 119, call me up and let's talk about where we're going to be, okay? But that's how it works because if you make it past 121, the insurance company pays you out the death benefit. They are tired of playing in the sandbox with you. They don't want anything else to do with you. They will not allow you to be a customer of theirs at age 122 and above. They just won't, okay? But Let's go back to the example. Cash value, 400000 death benefit of a million dollars. Now, Derek, let's say that you had all $400,000 borrowed out of that policy. And all of a sudden, today is your graduation day. You die, pass, graduate, whatever word you want to use. Well, the value of that policy, Derek, is $1 million. So the $1 million death benefit is going to pay out but they've already given you 400,000 of that while you're living. They've already given you 400. So what they're going to do is pay off that policy loan of 400 and the additional 600,000 goes to your beneficiaries tax free. Now let's say you had no money borrowed out and you have a 400 cash value and a million dollar death benefit. The value of your policy is still the $1 million. So in the columns where it says cash value and death benefit, sometimes people think, very rarely, but sometimes they think, and I think sometimes agents aren't clear with this, is some people think you get the cash value and the death benefit. No, the value of the policy is the death benefit. So when you die, if there's any policy loans, the death benefit pays off the cash value. So in that case, if you had no policy loans, then the thing you did is you died. One million dollars will go to the beneficiaries instead of the 600 because they didn't give you 400 while you were living. All right. That, that makes some sense. Um, I want to wrap up. Be respectful of your time. Any Anything else you want to, that I should have asked you, you want to make sure you, you say or cover? Uh, and then we'll make sure to put all the links in the show notes with books and stuff you mentioned. But yeah, anything you want to make sure? Yeah, well, well, there's, again, right, there's so much. We could talk about this for hours and hours. And I think I even mentioned before we went online, Derek, if you want to do a part two, part three, I'm open to do that. I love sharing this with people. And, and, and of course, I hope if the audience, if, if they are going to start doing this, I hope I'm the one they do it with. I hope they come to us at the Money Multiplier. You don't have to. Maybe you, you don't like my personality or my attitude, or maybe I didn't bring enough energy to the podcast today. Whatever it is, that's okay. I just want you to have the information. Yes, I would love to work with you and your all of your members, but I'm not the only guy that does this. There's other people that do it. But now that you know a little bit about this, and I'm going to encourage you, whether you work with me or not, go to the website. You can send me an email, brentatthemoneymultiplier.com, or go to the web website, www.themoneymultiplier.com. Um, go watch my full 90-plus minute presentation. I've also got over 70-plus videos on there. Go out and research and look at that stuff. Go Google my name. 
Go YouTube my name, Brent Kessler, Kessler with one S. The guy that wrote the book with me, Chris Noggle. If if a lot, you guys are real estate investors, a lot of you have heard of Chris Noggle. He's very active in the real estate world. And anyway, Derek, I'm going to suggest he gets on one of your podcasts to talk about this with real estate. But Chris Noggle has also had a couple shows on TV, one on House Hunters, another one on HGTV called Risky Builders. Go watch Chris Noggle and watch what he's doing. Just go to chrisnoggle.com. Um, so my daughter does this very actively. She teaches this. We travel. We teach live on stage. I do events. She does events. We do Zoom, podcast, virtual. So if any of you have places that you think we should be on stages, virtual or live to share this information, please reach out to us. Um, it might be me. It might be my daughter. It might be Chris or other people on our team. But my daughter, Hannah, She's 23 years old. She bought her own house with her policy. She bought one of those customized vans. Have you ever seen those Amazon Prime vans? Well, she took one of those and she customized it into a camping van. She's got about $135,000 into this thing. It has a bed, a bathroom, a shower, a toilet. I mean, because that's what she likes to do. It's just her and her cat. It's even got a, it, it's the van's even got a place for her cat to use the bathroom. It's got a litter box inside of the van. So she totally customized this thing out and she used her banking policies to do that. Why? Because she's going to recapture and recycle the money. About 10 days ago, she calls me up and says, dad, I'm tired of driving this 2011 Buick LaCrosse that mom gave me years ago. I want to finally go out and buy another car. So what did she do? She ordered a brand new Ford Bronco. It's called the Heritage Edition. It's yellow. They only make 6,000 of them. It was hell just to try to find a dealer to order it. So that's coming in in three to four months. And the reason I tell you this is because all of these items, what she's going to do is recycle and recapture and get all of her money back. It doesn't matter what it is, a car, a house, whatever, a bicycle, a boat. Go out and follow Hannah. Okay, her name is Hannah Kessler, and every week she does a podcast. Wherever you get your podcast from, Download the Money Multiplier podcast. She has over 60 podcasts out there, and she records one every single week. There's another guy out there. His name is Devin Burr. Now, Devin Burr has over a 1,000 followers on like Instagram and social media and also TikTok, which I guess isn't around anymore. I don't know much about social media. Okay, but 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 like uh, Instagram and YouTube, he has over a million followers, and his name is Devin Burr, B U R R, and he has, and I think his tagline when you go on social media, it's Mister Burr. So it's M R underscore B R R R R. So his last name is spelled Burr, B U R R, but it's B R R R. Whenever you go, follow him. So Devin is a big real estate investor. He's a client. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona. He will show you. He Just go follow him. He shows you how he uses this banking concept to buy all of his, all of his properties, all of his real estate, and he recycles and recaptures the money. And then the last reference I'll give you today is there's two guys, Jonah and Jeremiah. They have been with me for years and years, okay? Even, even back when I was with the other agency, they were clients of mine, right? Ever since I've been doing this. I've been teaching this now for 11 and a half years, and I think they were with me from basically the beginning. Jonah and Jeremiah, okay? Um, anyway, their last name is Dew, D-E-W. They're brothers. They have something called thebankingbros.com. The Banking Bros, B-R-O-S. Now, a lot of people think it's called the Banking Bros because they're two black guys, but no, they're brothers. They're black and they're brothers. So thebankingbros.com, they have a ton of content out there as well. Go follow all of their stuff they're doing. Go to our website, themoneymultiplier.com. On the event calendar, it shows you all of the events that we're doing. We're constantly updating those all the time. So if you're in a city, or a state near to where we are. And then just as a reminder, if you guys email me, brent at the money I'll send you this ebook 
mapping out the millionaire mystery. I will put the links in there. Thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate you coming on and uh, I, I will, uh, I will follow your advice and do some homework and, uh, and see, see what I think. And I, and I'd love to have you come back on. I'll get some more questions and, and we could do this again, but, but, uh, but thanks very much. Absolutely. Derek, thank you for having me. I'm grateful and I hope to be able to serve you and your listeners in the future. Thanks for joining us and being part of our conversation today with Mr. Brent Kessler. I'll make sure to put all the important links from today's show in the handy show notes below so you can check them out later. Now, I would ask again, if you found any value in our content, we'd love your help in spreading the word. And we'd ask you to do us a favor and share it with someone else. Your support means a lot to us. And together, we believe we can inspire others to achieve greatness. And as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, interesting fact, nearly 98% of you have not subscribed on whatever platform you like to listen to me on. We'd be incredibly grateful if you could take a moment to hit that subscribe button. It's a small action. It goes a long way in supporting us. Thanks again for tuning in. And guess what? We have new podcasts coming out three times every week. So don't just be a passive listener. Embrace the work you were meant to do and make each day truly amazing. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.